Welcome to our video. The topic this time is China's Peking Power, an interview with Michael Beckley. This is part one. Could you talk a little bit about your background and why you began studying China and what the environment of the US-China relationship was like at the beginning of your career? I was always interested in the rise and fall of great powers. At the time, it was the early to mid-2000s when China was booming and looked poised to rival the United States as a superpower. I thought, this is going to be the event of my generation. Even though the war on terror was raging and many people in my PhD program were studying counterinsurgency, I just thought for the future, the rise of China is clearly the most important event, and so I just threw myself into it, and I started traveling to China on a regular basis in 2008. The first time I went there was a month or two before the start of the Olympics in 2008, which even to this day, people remember as China's coming out party. This was when China really announced its great power intentions on the world stage. I was determined to write my dissertation on decline management for the United States. If you're a great superpower, how do you hand off power and responsibility to a rising power without triggering a massive war? But then the longer I spent in China, the more I started to see the weaknesses in the Chinese system. Then, I started digging into the data on China's economy, on its social policy, on its military, and just realized that some of these weaknesses were debilitating, and that, if you looked ahead, they're probably only going to get worse in the future. Then, I just started charting them and collecting all this data, and when I looked back at the charts, I just saw this chronic gap between the United States and China. That then shifted my focus to really trying to explain, how do countries amass wealth and power? What causes the rise and fall of great powers? You started out your career thinking you would do research about the US being a falling power and China being a rising power. But now, of course, a lot of your research since then has been about how China will not overtake the US as a global hegemon, which you talk about in your book, Unrivaled. Can you elaborate more on why you think that? And have you ever reconsidered that assessment that China doesn't have the ability to overtake the US? The two main arguments I make in the book and in related articles are first, that the gap between the United States and China is a lot bigger than most people think. That's because most people measure the balance of power with gross indicators, such as GDP, military spending, trade volumes, research and development spending, and manufacturing output. What I've found historically is that these are terrible indicators of national power. They're really no better than a coin toss about who actually wins disputes and wars internationally, or which country becomes dominant. For example, China in the 19th century had the largest economy and military in the world. But it still just got ripped apart, first, by the British whose economy was half of China's size and who had a much smaller military, and then again by the Japanese. I thought, wow, our whole discipline is based on simplistic measures of power that can't even explain well-known cases in international history. I decided to develop better indicators, and the basic insight I found was that you have to look at power in net terms, not gross terms. The problem with all those indicators I talked about before is that they systematically exaggerate the power of countries with big populations, because they count all the advantages you get from having a big population, like a big economy a big military, but not the costs of having to support and protect and clean up after that massive population. So what I did was I created these new measures of net wealth and net military power, for example, where you basically just put each country's assets and liabilities up on the board and just do some basic arithmetic and you can come to some bottom line calculations. This explains the China-British case. The British had a much smaller economy and smaller population but they also had a lot fewer mouths to feed. They had better technology and were way more efficient, so in net terms, they had much more wealth and vastly greater military power than China and trounced the Chinese in the Opium Wars. It's the same thing today between the United States and China. So that's the first argument, the overall economic and military gap between the United States and China is much larger than most people think. The second argument is that the US has better fundamentals than China and is therefore more likely to amass even greater wealth and power in the future. Countries rise and fall for more big-picture tectonic forces that are almost beyond anyone's immediate control, things like geography, 
demography, and political institutions. I found that when you plot these, the United States just has much better fundamentals going forward. It's just going to have a much easier time than China. China, demographically, is going to go through the worst aging crisis that we've ever seen because of the one-child policy. Geographically, China is surrounded by more than a dozen hostile or unstable countries, and it has decimated its natural resources, having lost half its freshwater and arable land over the past couple decades and become the world's largest food and energy importer. By contrast, the United States is a food and energy exporter because its territory is packed with resources and surrounded by friends and fish with just Canada, Mexico, and two oceans. Institutionally, the United States obviously looks completely shambolic right now, but China looks even worse because at this point it's become this rigid oligarchy that's ruled by a dictator for life, and Xi Jinping has consistently shown he'll prioritize political power over economic efficiency. When I plotted out these long-term drivers, it just seemed like the US had better, not perfect, but better fundamentals than China, so in addition to a big lead, the United States also has more advantages. That's why I'm pretty confident in the overall balance of power. Now, you asked me, have I reassessed this? Basically, my research has gone through three phases. The initial phase where I thought China was overtaking America, and I wanted to explain how to make that happen peacefully. Second, showing this gap in power between the United States and China. Now, the third phase of my career is really focusing on what happens when a rising power realizes it's going to fall short and that it's actually not going to overtake the dominant power. That its economy is starting to slow and it's starting to get surrounded by rivals. Basically, what happens when a rising power peaks? I've been studying this for the last three or four years and it just scares me because every case where this has happened has not ended well. Peaking powers do not go down without a fight. They don't mellow out. They tend to get more aggressive as well as repressive internally. China seems to be basically following the historical pattern to AT. It's not that I necessarily question my initial takeaways from that second phase of research, but now I'm just so much more aware that even if China never comes close to rivaling the United States and overall power, that doesn't mean that's not a massive threat both to the United States and to the rest of the world. You can have a country whose economy starts to become stagnant, but then puts all of its resources into a short-term military operation. I'm really worried that that actually could be the case with China over something like Taiwan. Even if the country overall is stagnant, if it's an authoritarian regime, it may actually actively promote authoritarianism around the world, precisely because it's scared that as it gets weaker, forces of regime change are going to start coming for it, so they need to prop up authoritarians around the world, or they may feel they need to carve out an economic empire, because they need captive markets and access to resources that they worry they won't be able to get just from a booming economy, which they no longer have. Now, I'm just looking at all these ways where China may become more aggressive even as the long-term threat of a rising China may dissipate. That's all for now. To be continued in part 2. Thank you for watching.